Okay, we have uh, two seats up here. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the town of North Beach, the jewel of the Chesapeake Bay, as we like to be referred to. Um, the mayor of the town of North Beach is here today, so I'd like to introduce Mayor Mark Frazier. I'd like to thank the town of North Beach for letting us use their town hall facility so that we could have this lecture today. I also would like to acknowledge the Calvert Library. Would everyone with the Calvert Library stand? Today. And then I see Hillary. How about the Friends of the Railway Museum? And I see Harriet. Can we have the Railway Museum stand? And then could we have everyone with the Bayside History Museum stand? for having this lecture today, but most importantly, we need to thank Dr. Ralph Eshelman. Ralph, you wear so many hats, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Um, he is the former director of our beautiful Calvert Marine Museum. He has authored at least, what, six or seven books on the War of 1812? Five, okay. <laughs> The, a book on this beautiful, beautiful steamboat history for Calvert County. And it's a real honor that he is here today to let us know what's right in their backyard because they've been gone for a while and a lot of people really don't realize how important the steamboats and wharfs were to the economic engine of Calvert County. So without further ado, Dr. Ralph Eshelman. Sounds off. Can you hear okay back? Yeah, yeah. Very good afternoon. I usually start out a little talk like this by saying you really need to move up front so you can see better, but I think that's not going to work here. <laughs> so for those of you that are away in the back, some of this might not show up as well as I would like. But it is indeed a real pleasure for me to be able to speak before you and to have so many people turn out on a Sunday afternoon I think is very, very impressive. So thank you all for doing that. I want to start out by asking you guys a question, and that is, how many of you have ever sailed on a steamboat? Just a show of hands. Not too many. But you can still do that. A lot of people don't think about it. But for example, if you go to Mystic Seaport, they have a steamboat called the Sabino. And you can take a beautiful little run out on Mystic River. And I was fortunate enough to be in Copenhagen several years ago and went out on an excursion on a steamboat. And then I did one also in New Zealand. So there still are places where you can hop on a steamboat. But the difference is that those are steamboats that are being used to lure in tourists. And what we're talking about is a period of time when the steamboat was a very important cog in the economy for transportation and transport, not just in southern Maryland, but throughout the Chesapeake Bay and much of the coastal areas of not just the United States, but the entire world. And so think about in the Chesapeake in 1813, that was the first year that a steamboat attempted to operate. That's a tough time because that's when the British were essentially occupying the Chesapeake Bay. But that's when the first steamboat came to the Chesapeake. And the first steamboat came to the Patuxent on a regular schedule in 1821. So we're talking about a long time ago. And steamboats came to this area as recently as the 1960s. Although, for the most part, you could say that by the late 30s, most of the steamboat era in the Chesapeake Bay was pretty much over. But that's a long time. From 1813 to, let's say, the late 1930s, and even some excursion boats that were operating until the 1960s, that's a long time that we had steamboats operating here. I wish that I were a period of time when the steamboats were still active, but I was born after the heyday of that. So I didn't get to experience that myself. But what I'm going to try to do is to help you have a better appreciation as to how important steamboats were and steamboat landings. And I'm going to concentrate on Calvert County 
So I'll talk about some of the landings and the steamboats that operated on the Bay of Calvert County, as well as on the Patuxent River. And I know we have people here who are from outside Calvert County, but the same kind of thing that we talk about here would be appropriate to what you would have experienced in other parts of the state of Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay as well. Now I want to start out by recognizing Ann Sutterman, who is right over here. Ann, stand up. Yeah. Ann, Ann is the author of the book that some of you may be familiar with, and I've actually got a picture of it showing up here in a couple of minutes. And I just wanted to let everybody know that this is based on a study that I was very fortunate to do for Calvert County Historic District Commission back in 1996. And it involved me taking my boat and going up and down the Patuxent River and looking where these old steamboat wharfs were located and documenting them. And then I did the same thing on the Chesapeake Bay side. I mean, talk about being paid to go do something like that that was so much fun. And so then I hand in this document, and then in the year 2001, Ann came out with this book, which is in part based upon the study that was done by Calvert County government. And if you're interested in this, they're still available, and you can buy them at the Calvert County Historical Society, which is at Linden House. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Linden House as well in this particular presentation. <clears throat> Now, if you look at the image that I have up right now, with a title on it, anybody recognize where that's located? It's in Calvert County. That's down at Solomon's. You're standing on the wharf at Solomon's Island. And the first wharf in Solomon's Island was not built until 1891. I think you might have lost your mind. It's because I have to, I, I like to roam. So whenever I get away from them, I can you guys raise your hand. This is the Solomon's Island Wharf, the Steamboat Wharf. And that wharf was first built in 1891. Prior to that, steamboats came in, but they didn't use a wharf. And that's because the water was so deep next to where the landing was, all they did was throw out a gangplank. And people would walk from the gangplank right off the boat, right onto the land. But in 1891, they built that wharf. And if you look in the background, you can see the remains of the old fish factory that used to be at Solomon's. So this is the book that I was talking about, Harbors, Creeks, and Places, The Steamboat Wharves and Landings of Calvert County, Maryland. And I'd highly recommend that if you're interested in this, this is something you would like to have in your library. Now, for those of you in the back, you may not be able to see this very well, but this is a map of Calvert County, obviously. And if you look at those big black dots, <coughs> That's showing you where steamboat wharves were located. So you can see that there's dots along the Bay Shore, and you can see there are dots along the Patuxent River. One thing I'd like you to imagine here is that because of the geography of Calvert County, we're a peninsula. We have water, navigable water, on three sides of our county. What other county can claim that? There is no place in Calvert County that's more than five miles from navigable water. Mm -hmm. So steamboats were very, very important to the economy of Calvert County, more so than even many of the other counties. One other thing that I want to point out to you, which is kind of hard for me where I'm located right now, but there are two dots side by side. Can you make those out? Mm -hmm. That's the only place I know of in the entire Chesapeake Bay where there were two steamboat landings that were right opposite each other, less than a quarter of a mile away, and that was on St. Leonard Creek. And the reason for it is that St. Leonard's Creek penetrates so far into the county that for farmers to get their goods, if they had to go all the way around that creek to get their goods to the steamboat landing, it would have taken so much time. So that's a place where they had two steamboat landings, one opposite the other, in view of each other. Only place I know of in the entire Chesapeake Bay. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. Now, again, for those of you in the back, you probably can't see this very well, so I have a little bit of a blow-up of it. This is a better way to look at the Patuxent River because here I'm showing you the landings that are on both the Calvert County side as well as on the other shores of the other counties that are on the Patuxent River. And if you look at the little uh, plaque that I have up there, you can see that in Anne Arundel, there's one steamboat landing. In Calvert, there were 14. In Charles, there was one. In Prince George's County, there were four. And in St. Mary's County, there were seven. 
So I don't mean that there were only seven wharves in St. Mary's County. There were seven wharves on the Patuxent River in St. Mary's County. But for Calvert County, if you want to add all of them up, you're talking about in excess of over 20 wharves that were located in Calvert County. And for the entire Patuxent River, there were over 27 steamboat wharves. And if we go back to this image that I showed you before, and you look at some of the other regions of Southern Maryland, you don't see anywhere near the high density of steamboat wharves that you see for the Patuxent River. And that's in part because the tobacco economy of the Patuxent River and also the peaches and other fruits and vegetables, some of the best growing areas in the entire Southern Maryland area were right around the Patuxent River. This was a major, major area where these different products were being shipped, principally by steamboat. If we go back and look at some of the earliest types of, sea, of steamboats, I think all of you are familiar with the Claremont developed by Fulton. And sometimes you'll hear, hear people say that this was the first steamboat that was ever invented. That's not true. The Claremont, the original name, by the way, which was called the North River. Anybody know why it might have been called the North River? Because the Hudson was originally referred to as the North River. It's a river that runs to the north. And then afterwards, it was changed to the Claremont. But Fulton, when he developed this in 1807, this was the first successful, economically successful steamboat that operated in the United States. So that's why it's very well recognized by people. And you can see pretty much what that steamboat would have looked like. Now down below, I'm showing you an image of what is known as the Chesapeake that was built in 1813 and also operated on the Chesapeake Bay. Do you see a similarity there? That from 1807 to 1813, not, really not that much difference. Where did that come from? Well, here is a broadside where they're promoting trips on board the Chesapeake. And this is out of a, a newspaper, June 13, 1813. And if you look at that image of the steamboat, people have jumped to the conclusion that that's what the Chesapeake looked like in 1813. And I'm here to tell you that it is not. This is where scholars have made mistakes, and scholars make many mistakes, including myself. But this is the drawing, and the drawing is done by Samuel Ward Stanton, and it's very clear to me, you can see exactly where he got the idea as to where to make that drawing from. He took it from that newspaper article that dates from 1813. The problem is, think logically about it. If you're a publisher, are you going to hire someone to go out and specifically make a drawing of a steamboat that's then going to be in your advertisement? Or are you going to take a generic image of a steamboat that, by the way, is very likely to be the Claremont because it's been around for so much time? And that, in fact, is what you're looking at there. You're looking at an image of the Claremont. It's not an image of the Chesapeake. And here's the reason that I know this. This is a drawing that was done in 1814, and it's showing the bombardment of Fort McHenry. This is an example of where research in one discipline can help you in something in another discipline. And this particular image is considered one of the most accurate images of the bombardment of Fort McHenry that's ever been produced. And if you look over to the extreme right, you can see the American flag, the Star Spangled Banner, flying over Fort McHenry. But I ask you to look at what's inside that circle. And what you're looking at right there inside that circle is an eyewitness drawing of the steamboat Chesapeake. And here is a blow-up of it. And here is that same drawing. Do they look the same? They don't look the same at all. So you see how history can be wrong because people make assumptions that are not necessarily correct. Here's another example. Weems Steamboat Company. I hope everybody in this room is aware of the fact that when you talk about steamboating on the Patuxent River, it's synonymous with the Weems Steamboat Company. Of all of the operations that went all over the Chesapeake Bay, Weems is really the principal steamboat company that serviced our area right here. And this is a stock certificate. And you would think that on a stock certificate, they would show you an image of a Weems steamboat. <laughs> There's a blow-up of it right there. But again, we have exactly the same situation. 
I tried to determine what steamboat was that. And I found this drawing of the Louisiana, which, by the way, despite its name, is a steamboat that operated in the Chesapeake Bay. And then if I turn that drawing backwards so that it's the mimic of what you see up above, there's a very, very strong similarity there. The main difference is that you see there's two smoke pipes down on the bottom image and only one above. And I don't know if that's because you're looking at it dead on from the side where both of those pipes are identically hidden behind one another or whether that's just a, a mistake in the drawing. I don't know that, but I suspect that that image that you have on the Wien Steamboat stock certificate is the Louisiana that never belonged to the Wien Steamboat Company. So again, you cannot draw a conclusion. I hope people recognize this particular place. This is in Prince Frederick. This is the home of the Calvert County Historical Society. It's known as Linden House. Who lived in Linden House at one time? Who owned Linden House? None other than Henry Williams, who became the chief executive officer of the Weems Steamboat Company. And how did that happen? He married very well. He married into the Weems family. And when his wife's brother passed on, he took over the operation of the Weems Steamboat Company. So here we have a house that belonged to the gentleman who at one time operated the Weems Steamboat Company. I might add, not at the same time. What do some of these steamboats look like then? I've shown you an image of what I think the Chesapeake looked like. But we have to go to the American Civil War. And we have to go to people like Brady, who was taking these wonderful photographs of what was going on during the American Civil War. And if we had lived right here in Calvert County during the American Civil War, steamboat operations would have been severely disrupted. And the reason for it is that the Union Army was coming in and taking the steamboats to use them to transport troops and supplies all over the Chesapeake Bay area. So you didn't have regular service like you had prior to the American Civil War, nor after the American Civil War. And the Weems Steamboat Company suffered just as much as any of the other companies. So most of their steamers were taken by the Union, but they were given a daily wage. Essentially, they were renting those boats and they were making anywhere from maybe $100 to $250 a day, which was good money back then. The problem is that when you got your steamboat back, it had not been well taken care of, and you probably actually lost money in the deal. But if you look at some of these photographs, you're going to see some of the images of the Weems steamboats that operated on the Patuxent River. And this is the Winona. Not a great image. This is a blow-up of it. You can see it's kind of fuzzy but it gives you an idea as to what it looked like. So what I want you to imagine while you're looking at these images is that these are the very vessels that were going up and down the Patuxent River, going all the way up the Chesapeake Bay to Baltimore. <coughs> this was your connection to the big city. This is the planter. This is another one of the steam, the Weems Steamboat Companies. And here's a close-up of it. And here's some other images. This was a hospital ship, and so there's more images of it than most of the other steamers that operated in the Chesapeake Bay at that time. By the way, most of these images are from the Rappahannock River. Some of them are also from the James River. But those are all images of the Patuxent River steamer that was running up and down all of these wharves prior to the Civil War and a little bit after the American Civil War. So let's take a look at some of these wharves and some of the steamboat activity. And we're going to start down at the, the mouth of the Patuxent River. So the first place is going to be Solomon's. And this is not a photograph, obviously. This is a painting that was done by Brian Hope, who's one of the Bay Pilots. He did this as a fundraiser for the Calvert Marine Museum. He did this at no cost so that we could make prints and then sell them to generate some money. So this is one of the first fundraising efforts that the Marine Museum had back in its infancy. But what you're looking at is a steamer called the Westmoreland. That's a Weems steamer tied up at the dock at Solomon's. And in the background on the left-hand side, you can see the Solomon's house. That's where Isaac Solomon's lived. That's the oldest house in Solomon's today. This is an aerial of Solomon's. 
the debris. Remember I talked about deep water. Well, right over there is where the steamboat wharf is. And so steamboats could literally come right in through there, dock on a couple of pilings, throw out a gangplank, and you could walk right off of the vessel right on the land. So again, it was only in 1891 that a wharf was actually built there. This is a particular photograph was taken in the 30s. Look at the clarity of the water. Look at the submerged aquatic vegetation that's there that we don't have today. And just to get yourself oriented, in fact, you can see that Solomon's is an island, even though when you go down there you may not notice that. And then if you go way up here, it's hard for me to see exactly where I am, but that's the home of the Calvert Marine Museum where the old Solomon School is located. <coughs> and this is what the warehouse looked like. Typically when you had a steamboat landing, you had at least one warehouse. And that's where goods would be kept until the steamboat came so that it could be shipped back to the city, or where goods that were being shipped out of the city could be retained until the local individual that it was being sent to could come and pick it up. That's what these warehouses were. And you can see that this particular one is number 212 indicating there were over 212 warehouses in the Chesapeake Bay. And this is what it would look like if you were on the landing. Notice how the people are dressed. Most of them are dressed better than how we're dressed today just to come to this particular lecture. But that's what people did back then. This was a social event. This is where you were going to meet not just people in your community, but you were going to meet people that were coming down to visit. You were going to meet tourists that were coming down to maybe spend a week in one of the, the houses that they could rent down here and go swimming and fishing and sailing and crabbing and whatever else they might be doing. I also want you to notice that it looks like some military personnel right in through there. This fellow and this guy right here, they work for the steamboat company. Notice the pen right here. This is where livestock would be kept. So if you were selling cattle or sheep or hogs or whatever it might be, that's where they would be kept because you wanted them to be live by the time they got to the meat market, wherever that might be, typically in Baltimore. So I'd like you to imagine the smells. Mm -hmm. You've got the smell of the steamboat. You've got the smell of the wood of the wharf. You've got the smell of the water. You've got the smell of the manure that's been dropped by the animals. It's an amazing smell, a combination of smells. Think of the, the sounds, the whistle of the steamboat, the steam of the steamboat. The sounds of the people, the excitement. What, yep. year, what year is that, that photo right there? I don't know the exact uh, date on this particular photograph. It's from the Calvert Marine Museum, but we're probably talking about the 30s. Some of these are dated, and I'll show you some other examples. Uh, this one is 1906, and notice how the people are dressed. It's really amazing. People dressed up just like as if you were going to church, and in fact, people going to church today oftentimes don't dress up as nice as that, but they used to. And that's the same image that I had on the front cover, kind of the title page for this. Just wanted to show you some examples. This is from a steamboat looking down on the wharf. Look at the number of people that are there to greet the steamboat. And you can see the gangplank right there that would be thrown onto the vessel. And you can see people coming right off of a gangplank right there. Again, just to kind of give you an impression as to what it was like. This is not a, a Sunday. This is a typical day when the steamer would come in. The old truck. You can still see the fish factory on the left-hand side. I wish I could have lived back in that time. I probably wouldn't have appreciated it as much, but boy, it just, it'd be wonderful. That's Solomon's 1902. Look at how they're dressed up. And look at all the cars. You talk about traffic jams? Steamboats created traffic jams because everybody wanted to come down to see the steamer coming in. It was a major social event. And if you look at the pipe right there, can you make out which looks like kind of a that image right there, that's an indication that this was part of the Philadelphia Railroad Company. The Philadelphia Railroad Company bought out many of the steamboat companies, including the Weems Company. And this is an excursion vessel coming into Solomon's. These are the last vessels that came into Solomon's. So we're talking about the 50s and the 60s.
Okay, let's take a look at Millstone. Millstone is on the St. Mary's County side. And the reason I wanted to show you this is that this is a smaller wharf, but you can still see that even though it's smaller, you've got a bunch of rack wagons out here. You can also notice you've got a track with a cart on it so that you can haul the material from the end of the wharf where the steamboat lands all the way up to the landing where it can then be put onto these wagons. But I also wanted you to notice all of this out here. What do you think is going on there? Firewood. That's firewood. That's the fuel for the steamboats. They were not using coal, at least not in the very earliest and middle times. They were using firewood. So there were certain landings where people were hired to go out and bring in the firewood that would be used to fill up the bends on board the, the vessels as they go between the different wharves. This is really one of my favorites. This is Maple Wharf. So if you guys are familiar with St. Leonard's Creek and you know where Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum is located, this is the road. If you don't go into the main entrance of the park, if you continue down to the very end, that's where this wharf was located, right there. So Jefferson Patterson Park is right over here. So this is St. Leonard's Creek, and you're looking at the warehouse out on the end, and you're looking at a couple of uh, carts. There's also a wagon right back in through here. And here you can see the steamboat. In this case, it's the St. Mary's. This is a Weems Company steamboat coming into the landing. And you also notice that on this particular wharf, they actually have railings on the side, which is very unusual. Most of the wharves do not have railings. Now, the St. Mary's was originally built as the George Weems, who was the founder of the Weems Steamboat Company, and it burned in Baltimore in 1889. But they rebuilt it and renamed it St. Mary's after our sister county, St. Mary's County. And then off of Benedict in 1707, it caught fire again and it burned. You see that little circle up there? That's where the paddle wheel would be inside that box. That's the paddle box. And inside that little circle I've got up there is a carving of an American eagle. And that's the American eagle that now survives at the Calvert Marine Museum. There's an interesting story behind it. Many of you guys know Senator Bernie Fowler. And he knew a friend who had a farm in St. Mary's County. And in that barn was this carving that had fallen off of the paddle wheel box when the steamboat caught on fire. And the owner found it floating in the Patuxent River and it washed up on the shore. And he put it in his barn. This is 1907. It stayed in his barn from 1907 to 1978 when it was donated to the Calvert Marine Museum. And the reason the wings are missing down here is because that's the part that was down on the ground where it was stored in the barn and it literally rotted away. But look what's left. And it still has some of the original gold gild on it. This is a tremendous <coughs> artifact. This is Brew House. This is the house that's located at Maple Wharf. It's still there today. And by the way, this sits on the site of the house where the first elected governor of Maryland lived, Thomas Johnson. The bridge from Solomon's over to St. Mary's County is named after the first governor. I'm not talking about colonial government. I mean the first elected governor when the United States became independent from England. This is the site where he lived, right there on St. Leonard's Creek. And that's the house. And behind it is the old store. Because it's a steamboat landing, it was very easy for people to get goods out of Baltimore. So if you needed a new pair of shoes, or if you needed a dress, or whatever it might be, you could order it through the store, and then it would be delivered by steamboat, and that's where you would come to pick it up. But in that store, they would also carry other types of provisions that you might need, because everybody came to the steamboat to welcome it, to see who was coming in, and who was doing this, and who was doing that, and that was an opportunity for you to do your shopping. And the reason I'm showing you that is that this is a historic photograph of it, is that when we were restoring the Drum Point Lighthouse, we had an old pot belly stove in there, and we needed some stove polish. And we didn't know where to get it, because you can't really buy stove polish anymore. And a fellow by the name of Jim Byes, who some of you might know, who lived on St. Leonard's Creek, he said, I know exactly where you can get some. 
And he took us down to the old maple store. And inside on the shelves were still bottles of stove polish. <laughs> and that's where we got the stove polish to take all the rust off of the old pot belly stove that's now at the Calvert Ring Museum. Some of you may know that uh, Don Chomet and a bunch of us uh, did some surveys of the Patuxent River, and one of the things we were looking at were some of the old steamboat landings. And this is the results of some underwater archaeological work that was done. The reason I'm showing you is that this is the wharf that's there today, but we were able to discern that the old original wharf was just to the west of it. And you can also see that apparently it was T-shaped. And then you can also see the remains of an old windlass that was out there to help lift things off the steamboat onto the wharf. And then there was also, we found evidence of some rails where apparently they had a cart on tracks just like we see on many of these other wharves to take goods from one end of the wharf to the other end of the wharf. And all of that's published in a book that Don did called Tidewater Time Capsule, History Beneath the Patuxent. If you're interested in learning more about kind of the maritime history of Calvert County and Patuxent River, that's a great book. I highly recommend it. Directly opposite, this is that place where I told you we have these two wharves right opposite one another, is known as Soller's Wharf. And that's a wharf that operated from 1822 to 1931. And you can see the warehouse building to the wharf there. And this is an old oyster house that's in very bad shape. And if any of you remember the original oyster exhibit at the Calvert Marine Museum when it was in the old schoolhouse, all of the furnishings, all of the equipment, all of the siding, everything that came from that exhibit came right out of that building right there. Mm -hmm. Everything. About when was that part of that? Too? That would have been 1976. And this is a photograph of what it looked like before it was in derelict condition. So there's the warehouse. This is where the steamer would come in. And there's the oyster house, and you can see all the oysters out there. And that's what it looked like over time. And now this is all gone. The, the storehouse is gone, warehouse is gone, everything's gone. I just wanted to tell you a story. This is the way I remember it. Jack Crane owns a farm down in this area. And he had grown tomatoes because a tomato packing house had just opened in Solomon's. And so he wanted to take advantage of that. So he had all of his farm hands load up all their tomatoes, put them in baskets, brought them down to the steamboat wharf. And the agent at the wharf only offered him two cents a bushel which didn't even pay for the cost of what the baskets were worth. So in protest, if you know Jack Crane, he ordered his men to dump all the tomatoes into the, into the creek, which turned the creek red for a couple of days. At least that's what they all said. So that's what he did in protest. But that's the kind of thing that you had to do back in those days, because the steamboat operator is the guy who was going to tell you what it was worth. And if you didn't agree to it, what was your other option? Were you going to take it by cart all the way, let's say, to Washington, D.C. or to Baltimore? You're pretty much stuck. And so if there was a, a glut of tomatoes to go down to Solomon's, they weren't going to pay you much for them. But if they needed tomatoes, they were going to pay you more for them. So that's the way it was, supply and demand. And this is the old store at Solomon's Wharf. So not only do you have two landings that are opposite each other, but you also had two stores for exactly the same reason. So this is what the store looked like on this side, and that is now kind of the community club for the people that live down in this area, and that still stands. In my opinion, this is one of the steamboat-related historic resources that should be saved in Calvert County. And there's the bell that used to stand out at the end of the wharf so that when someone wanted service, because you were typically either coming by boat or you were coming by horse and wagon. And you would ring that bell and the proprietor would know that somebody wanted to go into the store. And that bell today is preserved at the Calvert Marine Museum. Mm -hmm. Now, I threw this one in just this morning because I had a tip that there was a fellow by the name of Ron Clark who I've worked with who's sitting right over there right now who's working on a project. And that is that an African-American church known as St. John's United Methodist Church, was being dedicated on Sawler's Wharf Road. And we're talking about 1882. And to commemorate that, other parishioners from Baltimore 
chartered a steamboat called the Matilda. And you're looking at a picture of the Matilda. This is the only picture I know of that exists of it. <coughs> All the way from Baltimore, and they came to Sawyer's Wharf, and over 200 people got off and then walked up to the dedication of the church. And Ron tells me they're going to try to redo that as kind of a, an anniversary. And I hope you think it's going to be this August. Yeah, I think that would be great. So there's a tie into history, steamboating, the whole thing. That's really a great, great idea. So I hope that works out for you. Here's Soderley. You guys probably know Soderley better because of the plantation house that dates from 1707. It's the oldest plantation house standing <coughs> in the state of Maryland today. A beautiful place to go visit, but it obviously had a tie into steamboating as well because everything on that plantation once steamboats came in, it was all being shipped away, primarily tobacco, but also things like sheep and wool, that kind of stuff. And this is what the landing looked like there. This is the house that was down at, it still stands at the site of the wharf. And this is the old warehouse that's been moved off of the wharf and has now been turned into like a little storage area right next to it. So these are other examples of steamboat-related structures that still survive. And there's a little story that you can probably read for yourself down below. But in August the 2nd, 1899, there was a man who witnessed an unfortunate situation where a severe storm came up. And his wife, his three-year-old daughter, and a 16-month-old infant were blown off the wharf, and they drowned right in front of him. Mm -hmm. One of those tragedies that can happen anywhere around the water. This is Williams Wharf, 1937. I can tell you that this would not be the original wharf, but that would have been a steamboat wharf, but this is what it looked like in later years, 1937. That's in Calvert County. This is an interesting one because this is Parker's Wharf, which is also in Calvert County, and you're looking at the replacement of a warehouse that was destroyed in 1899. And what's unusual about it is that most of these warehouses were built as crudely as you could possibly be. But you look at this warehouse, this is, this is not done cheaply. This is an expensive building. And to this day, I don't know why it was built so elaborately the way it is. But I love the photograph here because you can see these uh, young men that have uh, obviously been swimming. And then it looks like a disarticulated wagon that probably was just taken off of a steamboat and waiting for assembly probably to be used somewhere by someone that lives near Parker's Wharf. Also wanted to mention to you about how things have changed, not just because of steamboating, but because of ferries. Now this is at Benedict. I'm sure everybody here has gone over Route 231 heading to Benedict. Well, think about what it was like prior to 1951 when that bridge was first built. It meant that you had to take a ferry. And ferries operated across that stretch of the Patuxent River in the late 17th century, right on up to 1951. And you're looking at a car barge that would take your car across that was eventually abandoned in 1951 when the bridge was completed. So think about how long it took to get across the river back in those days. If you showed up and the car barge was on the opposite side of the river, you would be honking your horn or you would be hollering. And that's why it's called Hollow, hollow Point. <laughs> and this is the, the wharf at Benedict. You can see that wharf goes out longer than most of the other wharves that I've shown you so far, because we're in a stretch of the river now where it's very shallow up along the shoreline there. So you had to get out to deep water, so you have to have a longer wharf. That costs more money. You can see that this is a popular wharf because it has two warehouses out there. And this is what it looks like from a steamer as you would be coming in. And look in the background. See those big piles of oysters? And there's an oyster packing plant directly in back of that. You see how this area has changed? This is another picture. And in back of that one, you can see a tomato packing plant. There were three tomato packing plants in Calvert County. There was one at Solomon's, there was one at St. Leonard's, and there was one at Plum Point. This is uh, Duke's, or many of you might know it as Sheridan Point. And this is the Anne Arundel. This is another Weems steamboat. And you can see it's up against the wharf. And here you can see three warehouses. One of them is very, very small, but three warehouses. 
And this is Holland Cliff. Not a particularly uh, significant spot, except the, the rent that the owner got for allowing the Weems Steamboat Company to come in here was over $400 a year, which was a lot of money compared to what most of the other wards were getting. And this is Truman Point. This is on the St. Mary side. And if you look on the land, you can see a couple of wagons. It looks like maybe a car in through there. People getting ready for the steamboat to come in. You can clearly see the name of Truman's Point right there on the end of the warehouse. You can see a wagon in the back with a couple of horses hitched up to it. This is all that remains of Ferry Landing Wharf. I have no historical photographs of it. If anyone has any, I'd love to see it. So all we have here are just the remains of the piles in the water. This is the only image I know of that exists of the wharf at Nottingham. And so this is from the land, looking at the warehouse. You really can't even see what the wharf itself looked like. This is Magruder's Landing. This is in Prince George's County. Again, I have no historic photographs of what it looked like. All we have are the pilings that remain in the water. All of these were done at low tide, as you can imagine. And then this is White's Landing. This is another one in Prince George's County. Exactly the same story. And then this is Lower Marlboro. And we have two people in the audience that I know of are from Lower Marlboro that live almost within view of this particular scene. Here you can see two warehouses. You can also notice they're very simple. You have a door at each end. You offload from the steamboat on one door, push it through to the other side, you offload it on that side into a cart or whatever, and take off or vice versa, depending on which direction you're loan, you know, loading the, the whatever the your the market goods might be. And this is what it looks like from the steamer looking down at the landing. And in the background you can see the Hinman store, also known as the Harbor Master's House, which is still there and is preserved with a beautiful structure. And this is what it looks like from the Hinman store looking down at the Potomac tied up with the wharf. Gives you an impression as to the size of the river up there. You can see the river is pretty narrow. But it's still deep. It's deep enough for a steamer to get up. A, most of these steamers drew about <coughs> 9 feet. So all you need was about 10 feet to get up there on low tide. And this is what the wharf looks like today. This is basically there for the fishermen. And it's not anything old. It's a, a recreation of what that wharf might have looked like. And then there's a little bit of interpretive material next to it. But it's a great place to go if you're ever heading down that way to get out and see what the river looks like. This is the bridge for the train that used to come down to Chesapeake Beach for the amusement park. And here you can see a steamer coming up. And because there was this bridge going across, they had to have a turnstile so that the steamers could still get across. And that's the turnstile right there. And in the background is Mount Calvert, if you're familiar with that particular section of the river. So that's what it looked like. And this is all that I know that exists of Bristol Landing. Some people you might refer to it as Pig Point. Same situation as many of these other landings that I told you about. But this is a significant wharf because it was at the head of navigation. And if you can see the detail here, this is out of the Corps of Engineering report. <coughs> and right around that circle you can see there were two wharfs that exist here. One was the steamboat wharf, and the other was the county wharf. And you see this kind of dark shaded area? That's where it had been dredged. This is where taxpayers' dollars were used to dredge to enable the steamboats to still come in there. And the dates of that dredging was September 18, 1889 to January the 2nd, 1890. They came back and they dredged all of this area, which you see right here, in 1904. And then they did another study in 1906, and they determined that there was enough, not enough traffic to warrant that any more dredging be done there. And so that was the end of this particular landing at the head of navigation on the Patuxent River. Is that picture in any of your books? Uh, I don't, and I don't think this is in your book, but if you're interested in it, I can very easily supply that to you. That's my great uncle, my great great uncle's property. Well, great. Uh, contact me, and I'll be more than happy to email you a copy of it. That would be wonderful. All of these images, by the way, I have digital copies of them. 
This is the actual highest wharf that existed on the Patuxent River. And this is on the Prince George's County side. And all you can see are these, again, these pilings that are left. This is known as Hill's Landing. When you guys take Route 2 and 4 and you go over Hill's Bridge, it's named after the Hill family that owned all the property that's just to the right-hand side as you're heading to Washington, D.C. What you may not know is that that was a significant industrial landing spot. There was a big, big sawmill up there where they were cutting all of the trees all around this area to make railroad ties. And then those railroad ties were being shipped by steamboat to Baltimore for part of the B&O railroad construction. So this is an image, and I believe this is the earliest image that I know of, of a steamboat landing on the Patuxent River. We don't know the exact date, but we believe that this is pre-Civil War. That's what it would have looked like. So let's take a look at the bay side. Isn't that impressive? That's a 2,000 foot wharf. And that's at Chesapeake Beach, not far from where you are right now. Now why did you have to go out that far for the same reason that you did at Benedict? Because on the Chesapeake Bay, it's very, very shallow. You had to get out to deep enough water. And for any of you who have waded out in the bay, you know you can go a long way out before the water starts to get deep. So this is known as the Long Wharf. 2,000 feet, and at the end of it you can see a steamboat. And the reason it was built, of course, is because of the amusement park that was built at Chesapeake Beach. But what it meant is that when you landed, you had a long walk. <laughs> Look at all those people. And then they got thirsty. And so then, you know, right at the very end, there'd be this great place where you could get lemonade and beer and all kinds of good stuff like that. Oh, it, was a, it was a great operation. This is what it looked like at the end of the wharf. Here you can see the Dreamland, which is tied up. This is an excursion boat. This is not a vessel that was looking for trade. It was taking people back and forth. And I'm just going to go over this a little bit with you because I find it very interesting. If you wanted to go on a round trip on the Dreamland from Baltimore to Chesapeake Beach, which was about 100 miles, it would cost you 50 cents. And that was back in the late 1890s and early 1900s. And then you could go on a moonlight cruise on the bay that didn't go down as far, didn't come down to Chesapeake Beach, but it only cost 25 cents. Boy, those were the good old days. And this is the Wilson Line. Some of you probably have been on a Wilson Line vessel, but this is one of their steamboats. I've been on a Wilson Line, but it wasn't a steamboat. It was an internal combustion engine. We used to go out of Washington, D.C., and go down to like Mount Vernon or go to Marshall Hall Amusement Park. That's that's the kind of thing we used to do. But you notice the track that's here on the they got smart at Chesapeake Beach for a small fee, you could hop on a little tiny miniature train and that would take you from the end of the pier. This is not Chesapeake Beach. So do not be confused. But I wanted to throw this one in just to kind of help you to imagine how important tourism was and recreation. This is Tolchester. Mm. And what you're looking at is a whale that had been caught in Massachusetts. The guy who operated Tolchester Beach bought it for $3,000, had it embalmed in Boston, <laughs> toured the East Coast, he made a lot of money, and then it was near the end of its usefulness, and by that I mean that it was beginning to stink pretty bad. <laughs> they took it to Tolchester Beach. I'm glad they didn't do this at Chesapeake Beach. And then people could come. This was a draw. Because you have to remember, people had never really seen a whale before. And so people would come to the beach just to be able to see this whale, and for an extra 25 cents, you could come up and have a cup of tea in the mouth of the whale. They don't properly show it, but they have a big hole in here to help keep the mouth up. All I can imagine is what the smell must have been like. And here's Plum Point Wharf. This is another one of my favorite wharves. Uh, you can see this was a photograph taken soon after it's been built. It's in really good condition right there. But here is the end of it, looking toward the land. And again, we're on the Chesapeake Bay, so you're a long way off. This is not as long as the one at Chesapeake Beach, but it's still a long, long wharf. 
This is only the second wharf that I know of that actually had railings on it. And you also see that it had a track on it so that you could get, get a cart, which made a whole lot of sense to take your merchandise from one side to the other. And then just on the background on the right-hand side, you can see the old Dixon store, which was essentially the steamboat wharf store. And this is from the land looking out at the wharf. And can you make out the steamboat coming in right there? It's a great shot. It's too bad it's not in focus. But it's the best that we've got. And that's the Dixon store right there, which many of you probably know was torn down a few years ago. This is what the Dixon store looked like. It predated the American Civil War. And it was built in three sections. You can see the roof line. One section there, one section there, and one section there. Supposedly there were two uh, Confederate sabers that were found inside of that uh, building. Uh, if you know uh, the Ireland family, they can tell you all about that story. And then here we are, I don't know why this is at Solomon's, but it looks like it's displaced. But here we have a ferry again, you can see a car on it. If you were down in Solomon's and you wanted to get across the Atoxan River to get over to St. Mary's before the bridge was built. You guys remember when the bridge was built? When it opened? December 1977. Wow. Not that long ago when you think about it. So that meant that you either took a ferry across or you had to go all the way up to Benedict and go around. And if you want to see more about some of the artifacts and whatnot of the steamers that came into the Patuxent River in the Chesapeake Bay area, I highly recommend the Calvert Marine Museum. Also the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum over in St. Michael's has some really nice exhibits. We've already talked about the eagle. But I wanted to show you, this is a box. It's on exhibit at the Calvert Marine Museum. And if you look closely at it, can you see the Hutzler Brothers? That was one of the big department stores in Baltimore. And can you make up right out here, Truman Point? This is a box that came off of a steamboat. So this was something that someone ordered from the Hutzler Brothers, and it was being shipped on a steamboat to Truman Point. Here's another example. This is a piece of furniture. I'm not going to tell you the house it came from because I don't think the owner would appreciate it. But if you look under the marble top, you can see some writing. And now I turn it up, and I don't know if you can read it very well, but it says Charles Solomon. Point patience. Can you make that out? And then it says steamer I can't even read it myself now. I can't remember. Um, let me get away from it. Oh, it says Weems Line, Baltimore, Maryland. There's another word in there that I can't figure out. But what you're looking at is a piece of furniture that was bought in Baltimore, and it was shipped down on a steamboat, and it had been disarticulated. So the marble top was taken off, the high rise off the table was taken apart, and then on each of those, someone had written so that they knew exactly where it was supposed to be delivered. And this was being delivered to Charles Solomon, who lived on Point Patience, and this came into the steamboat wharf at Solomon's. So this is something that was delivered by steamboat to Calvert County. And that's how most people got big items like that, whether it was furniture, a wagon, whatever it might be. Here's an outbuilding on the same farm. By the way, this farm is uh, near St. Leonard's Creek. And on the inside, you can look at one of the boards. And that's what it looks like straight on. And when I turn it upside down, you can clearly read Soller's Wharf. So here's a farm near Soller's Wharf. This is lumber that had been probably ordered from who knows where, maybe Baltimore, had been delivered, and the structure was built. But that lumber came from and delivered to Soller's Wharf. How about wharf work? You notice the African Americans doing most of the work here. I love that. <laughs> That's one way to get a sheep on board. <laughs> hogsheads of tobacco. You can see why hogsheads of tobacco were in barrels. So they could be rolled. Because it's too heavy for anybody to pick it up. But it's pretty easy to roll it. Each one of those barrels yeah. would weigh about a thousand pounds. And if you were a farmer, and let's say you had maybe 
grown enough tobacco to fill five or six hogsheads of tobacco, that would be most of the money that you made for that year. And you go to the steamboat wharf, if you and then off it went. And then you would get paid. This is not in Calvert County, this is Leonard Town. But I wanted to show it to you because, frankly, I don't know exactly what's going on here, except that you've got wagons full of whatever this stuff is, and you can see they're offloading it into here and into there, and then you've got empty wagons coming out there. But I don't know what they're loading. I have no idea what that is. I'd like to know. And then here's Galesville, up in Anne Arundel County, and here you can see a steer. You can see the number of people that it's taking to get that steer that doesn't want to go on more the steamboat. <laughs> and then they finally got it up close enough and it eventually made it on in. And then also think about back when the steamboats were around, and because everybody was kind of oriented toward the water, entertainment was a big deal too. So you had the James Adams Floating Theater. They went all around the Chesapeake Bay and offered plays and whatnot. And it would come into Solomon's and it would go to other places all up and down the Chesapeake Bay. A whole different time. You are looking at the inner harbor of Baltimore. Look at all those steamboats. And this is Light Street. That's what Light Street looked like when all the steamboats were coming into Baltimore. And you probably can't read it very well, but all of the names on here are the different companies. And the Weems Company was right down in here. So if you went to Baltimore, that's where you would get off the steamer, and then you would either walk or catch a wagon or whatever to get to the hotel you were staying at or the friends that you were staying with, and then when it was time to go back home, you'd go to that same spot, get on that wharf, and hop on the next boat that was heading back to where you wanted to go. And that must have been quite a thrill. I mean, for people to come into the big city by a boat like that, you probably only did it once or twice a year. I'm going to just read this to you. I've probably gone longer than I should, but I think you might find it interesting. This is a fellow who was taking a trip on the Patuxent River in September 5, 1870, and this is what he said. At every landing I saw bags of bacon, barrels of flour, barrels of cornmeal, and I've seen potatoes and hay carried ashore from a steamer. Each wharf has its quota of tobacco and peaches, which with the empty demijohns and little grain constituted almost the only articles of freight. As many as 60 or 70 hogsheads of tobacco, each weighing or ought to weigh about a thousand pounds, would be on a single wharf. And from one wharf we took 500 boxes of peaches. It is hard work for the steamboat hands to handle all the freight. And the idled, you can imagine what that word is, on the wharves are frequently hired to help them. Very, very different time from what it is today. But there was also the good side of it. In the 30s, if you wanted to go on a vacation, this is the kind of broadside that was being published to encourage people to go on tours. This is the Western Shore Steamboat Company that came into the Patuxent River. And this is a whole little promotional about what it would be like if you came and visited the Patuxent River and some of the places that you could come and visit. It talks about Solomon's Island. It talks about Benedict. It talks about visiting Sodderley, St. Leonard's Creek, all kinds of places that most of us just take for granted. But yet people that lived in Baltimore, they would read this and say, wow, that sounds like a neat place. Let's go on down. Let's see what it's all about. And here's just another example. This talks about Lower Marlboro. And then here are the rates. And unfortunately, there's not a date here. But if you wanted to take a ride from Light Street down to the Patuxent River, and you wanted to have four meals and have an outside stateroom. That meant you would have a window where you could look out and see what you were seeing. It would cost you $7 per person. If you wanted to have an inside stateroom, it cost $5.50. If you only wanted to come straight down, not as a tourist, but just to get to a particular place, one way it would cost you $2, but for a round trip it would cost you $3. Those truly were the good old days. And then these are places where they recommended that you would stay. Some of you might remember Messick's Hotel in Benedict, which was standing at least until the early 70s. When I first came down here, I remember it. But if you wanted to go to uh, Seven Gables, California, which is right across the river from where Solomon's is, in Solomon's, Bowen's Inn, which still exists, partially destroyed by a fire, but most of Bowen's Inn still exists, Micah's Hotel, uh, Abel's Inn, Avondale and Locust Inn. Locust Inn still stands in Solomon's. It's for sale right now, if anybody's interested. 
And then this is an example of Rikers Hotel, fishing parties arranged, even had a telephone. I mean, what more could you ask for? It's just like home. Uh -huh. So with that, I think I will end. I probably have gone longer than I should. But if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to try to answer them. If anybody needs to get up and go, I fully understand that. So I'm not offended at all. But if anybody wants to talk about steamboats, more than willing to do it. So I thank you all for your patience. Yes, sir. Yeah, good, good question. Were any of the steamboats built locally? No, they weren't. Um, there was a shipyard at Solomon's, but they did not have wheeled steamboats. So most of these were being built up in Baltimore. And most of the boilers and the engines and stuff like that were also being built in Baltimore. There were some built down in the Norfolk area, but most of the ones that fly at the Tuxedo were out of Baltimore. So good question. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I was with Brian Hope yesterday, right before the delivery of Scott Brown, and he asked me to ask you a question whether there were any steamboat wars from the Magothy River. There were. Yes, there were. The uh, Magothy didn't have as many uh, as the Patuxent, but I know of at least two that were up on the Magothy River. Almost every river in the Chesapeake Bay had a steamboat wharf if it had water that was navigable for them. We're also still sailing on a steamboat, if anybody's interested. The John Brown is yeah. a steamboat. I should have mentioned that. Uh, but thank you for mentioning that. We ride on it. If any of you are World War II veterans or Korean veterans, we ride next one. It's, it's a lot of fun. I can tell you about that, too, because I had the pleasure of sailing with Brian Hope on that. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> We were had two stacks. Is that two engines? Or one stack, one engine? It, the question was, do the side wheelers have one engine or two engines? And you could have either. So some of them had two engines. Most of them only had one engine. So that meant that you had a big cog wheel that went all the way through that vessel to operate those two paddles. And the other thing that's interesting is a lot of these early steamboats didn't have a reverse. So when you were coming in, you had to really know what you were doing. <laughs> There's only later years that if you had, you know, props, which came in later, if you had two props, it made it a whole lot easier to be able to turn. But these steamboats, it was a different story. And one thing I did mention, and you kind of reminded me about it, is that prior to steamboats, you were dependent upon sailing vessels. And sailing vessels were dependent upon wind as well as tides. And so you didn't have a regular schedule. If you got on a sailing vessel and say you were going to Baltimore, if you're lucky, you might get up there in six hours. But it could also take you three days. Or if there was a hurricane, you just have to wait for a week. I mean, but with a steamboat, you had more of a regular schedule. And that was the, the major advantage. Now, obviously, you didn't go out if there was a hurricane. But you didn't have to worry about tides so much because the steamboat could override the differences in the tides and that kind of thing. So the importance of the steamboat over the sailing vessel, it was a little bit more expensive, but it was more dependable. It was also faster. So that, that was the big advantage. And that's why I displaced sailing uh, vessels in the Patuxent River area. Really, pretty much by the 1840s, there was not much of that kind of freighting being done by sailboats in there. Any other questions anybody has? Yes, sir. I just wondered what the cruising speed was or, or top speed. The cruising speed. Uh, generally, you're only doing about maybe five to seven knots. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but compared to a sailing vessel, that's comparable, if not better. But keep in mind, it's steady. When you don't have the wind, you're still going at five to seven knots. They could go a little bit faster, but particularly these early boats were not all that dependable. Uh, one of the owners of the Lean Steamboat Company actually uh, was seriously injured when one of the boilers blew up. And because of that, he chose never to go back on the steamboat. So there were disadvantages as well as advantages. Yes, sir. That leads me to my question. I grew up in Memphis and uh, big steamboats on the Mississippi River. Uh, and uh, I was wondering, uh, it's my understanding that the biggest uh, the, the worst maritime disaster in the history uh, of maritime uh, navigation is the Sultana explosion. The boilers blew up on a ship called the Sultana, and I think it was somewhere around 2000. It was full of Confederate Civil War prisoners, and I wondered 
did anything, these boats look smaller than the boats on the uh, Mississippi, but were there any big uh, explosions? Yeah, excellent question, and I, you were loud enough, I think everybody heard it. Um, yes, the steamboats on the Mississippi were bigger, no question about it. Some of them were over twice as big, and the reason for that is they were carrying bales of cotton. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted to get as much of that cotton on board as they could. And they I couldn't. on the outside, so you had a lot of... Exactly. A lot of overhang and whatnot. So yes, it was for a different purpose, so they had bigger boats. But we also had major tragedies that happened in the Chesapeake Bay, and fire was the biggest one. And there was a church group who was out on a steamer. I don't remember the name of it, don't even remember the year. But over 200, mainly children, in a church group were burnt on a steamer that caught fire. So those things did happen. Um, but all in all, I would say it was worth the risk because it was more dependable than the sale was. Yes, ma'am. I'm glad you asked that question. She asked, what about the wharf at Cove Point? And if you're not familiar with Cove Point, that's kind of at the entrance coming into the Tuxedo <coughs> River. Cove Point was not a big wharf. There was not a whole lot of need for it. So it was known as a flag station. And what that meant is that when the steamer came by, if they saw a flag flying at the wharf, they would stop. And if it was nighttime, if you had a lantern hanging, they would stop. But otherwise, they wouldn't even bother going there because there generally just wasn't enough traffic to warrant a stop. So that was known as a flag stop or a flag wharf or whatever you wanted to call it. But Cove Point was an example of that. And some of those pilings are still there. Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. You commented on the Claremont that it was not the first steamboat. Are you referring to the, uh, James Rumsey and his experiments? Exactly. Well, on that? Yeah, I don't, again, I don't know if everyone could hear, but James Rumsey is also credited by some people as, as inventing the first steamboat. Uh, depending on the country that you might live in, you're going to hear stories about different people that take credit for being the first to come up with a steamboat. So that's why I tried to be very careful and say that Fulton is regarded as making the first economically successful steamboat because there were, no question, there were steamboats prior to it, but they didn't necessarily make money. And what Fulton was doing, he was going from Albany, New York, to New York City. And he could do that, I can't remember, something like seven hours, if the steamboat worked. And that was phenomenal, because as you know, there's a lot of current and whatnot on, on the Hudson River. So that's why he was successful. And the Livingston family that still have mansions and whatnot on the Hudson River were the people who put up the money for Fulton to develop that steamboat. Okay. One quick question. Was there a uh, ferry landing at Fair Haven? Was there a ferry landing at Fair Haven? There was. Yes. It wasn't one of the bigger ones, but yes, there was. Yeah. Almost every major in the Chesapeake that was on navigable water would have had a steamboat landing. It doesn't mean that they were all successful or they lasted for a long time. But people were trying to make money off of this. And some of them made money, most of them lost money. Weems was very successful. Yes, sir. And you, uh, off the top of your head, say which uh, wharfs where, you could, where we could drive today and see some evidence. Okay, what wharfs could you drive to today to see some evidence? You could go to Makel's Wharf, uh, but it's privately owned. So, you know, the best way to answer this, because I don't want to have people going on private property. The best way to do it, truthfully, is to do it by boat. And if you don't have a boat, then it's a little bit more complicated. But if you go at low water, you'll be able to see the pilings on most of these places. And maybe something that uh, we could do is we could get together and charter a boat and go out and go visit some of these. That'd be a lot of fun. But the only one that I can think of where you could drive up to it, uh, but you're not really going to see anything, is going to be Lower Marlboro. Because they have recreated the work there, but you're not really going to see any evidence of the old original work. But that's one that you could very easily get to. Almost all the rest of them are essentially private property where the roads have been cut off and blocked. And, uh, Unfortunately, we have a lot of questions. If anybody wants to get up and go, feel free. I'm not offended. Yes, yes, ma'am.
Yeah, the question is where would they get their fuel? And they would have regular stops where they knew that they would be getting wood. And so the companies would actually hire woodcutters to go out and supply the wood that would be needed to provide the fuel for the steamboats. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. It takes time to load up the wood, no question about it. But back in those days, you weren't in such a hustle bustle that you are today. So when you came into Solomon's, it was typical for the steamboat to stay in Solomon's for two hours. So that meant that you could get off and walk around, maybe take a little swim if you wanted, you know, go explore the town, get some ice cream, whatever, before the steamboat was going to leave again. So it just depended on where you were, what was going on. Yes, ma'am. I do know that, but not off the top of my head. The question is, when was Plum Point Pier built? What I can tell you is that in Calvert County, Plum Point, to the best of my knowledge, was the second oldest wharf ever built. There's evidence that a wharf was built there in the 1740s. The earliest wharf that I know of in Calvert County was built at the head of St. Leonard's Creek, which was a town known as St. Leonard's. And that predated the Plum Point by maybe five years. So Plum Point is a long, old place where landings were taking place. And by the way, Plum Point was not called Plum Point because of the fruit plum. It was because of a plum, P-L-U-M-B, which was used to sound. It's a lead weight, and it became corrupted over time. The original name of Plum Point was P-L-U-M-B which is a sounding device, it's a lead weight. And now we call it plum, and everybody thinks it's named after the fruit, but it's not. Okay. All the way in the back. Do you know when that store, Dixon's store, was uh, torn down? I don't know the exact date. Someone here probably knows, but I would say it's been within the last 10 years. Because I went there as a child, and they had heavy slot machines. <laughs> Yeah, the, Dix the Dixon store was uh, burnt, and Kirsty, I think, is here. I don't know, Kirsty, if you know, you know the date? I, you don't I think remember? it was longer ago than that, because More than it 10? was gone when I got here. I've been there uh, for 20 years. Okay. <coughs> that long ago? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I remember, uh, I came here in 74, and I remember visiting it many, many times, but okay. Well, time does fly. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Uh, was Solomon's the turnaround point? No, the turnaround point for the Patuxent River was Bristol Landing. And the one thing that I didn't uh, mention is that when they did the dredging up there in 1898 and then again in 1906, they dredged out a turning basin because the river is so narrow that the steamboat couldn't turn around. So they actually dredged out a basin which allowed the steamboat to turn around to come back down the river. And then in 1906, when the federal government said we're not going to do this anymore, that was the end of it. So. But, but for the Chesapeake Bay portion? Oh, the turnaround point for the Chesapeake Bay. It depended on the company. Like, for example, you might have the Piankatank River Steamboat Company. So all they were going to do is come down to the Piankatank. You could have the Eastern Shore Steamboat Company that would go all up and down. You'd have the Choptank River Steamboat Company. So there were all these little companies that essentially by about um, the depression, you know that big hurricane we had in 1933? That destroyed so many wars that most of these smaller companies couldn't make a go of it anymore. And so they sold their interests to the Pennsylvania Railroad. And then the Pennsylvania Railroad essentially became a big monopoly of most of the steamboat operations in the Chesapeake Bay. And they tried to continue to do it even though they were losing money. And then by about the 1950s, they knew the handwriting was on the wall and it was time to get out. But it's, yes, that didn't help. No question about it. You know, roads got better and better. So trucks became more efficient than steamboats. So that's how you have to think about all this. Because Calvert County, when you go back to 1813, you didn't have a single road that could come from one end of the county all the way to the other end. Most people were dependent upon water to get from one place to another. I mean, people sometimes even went to church by water. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. It, you have to really think about how things have changed over time. So then 
sailing vessels were replaced by steamboats, and then steamboats were replaced in this area primarily by trucking, and other areas they were replaced by the railroad. We didn't have so much railroading down here as they did in other places in the Chesapeake Bay. Okay, any other questions? My gosh. Okay, again, anybody wants to leave, feel free. All the way in the back. Did any of the comments that you're talking about ever go to Norfolk? Yeah, the question is, did any of the commerce around here ever go to Norfolk? And the answer is no. And the reason for that is that people that lived in this area didn't want to have a damn thing to do with Norfolk. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you're laughing about this, but some of you know Pepper Langley, who has passed away, but he was an old friend of mine. And I used to always talk to Pepper because he remembered the steamboat in here. And he always got, for example, a Baltimore newspaper. And I said, why do you have a Baltimore newspaper? I said, it's further away than a Washington newspaper. And he said, it's because of our connection to Baltimore. He said, we were connected to Baltimore by water, by the steamboat. And that's how everybody thought about it. You didn't think about Washington, D.C. if you lived in Solomon's. You followed Baltimore, because that was your connection to the outside world. It's only now that we have retired people that have moved down here, and we have bridges and better roads, that a lot of people think of Washington as a place to go for culture or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it used to be that with Baltimore. Everybody went to Baltimore, and that's the same thing with trade. You know, you shop in, in Maryland. You don't shop in Virginia, because Virginia's, you don't want them to get your money. <laughs> yes, sir. Prior to the steamboats, did the sailboats have the wharfs? Uh, yes. The, the many, the sailboats oftentimes used the same wharf. So when the steamboats came along, they would take the same wharf if, if it was decent. They might have to dress it up a little bit, put in extra dolphins, if you know what I mean by that, extra pilings that they would group together to take the impact of the steamboat. But yeah, they would use oftentimes the same, the same wharfs. And there was the Patuxent, what do they call it? The Patuxent River Freight Company. Um, there's a broadside preserved at the Calvert Room Museum, which was sail. And they were doing exactly the same thing that the steamboats did, but they could do it cheaper. But they couldn't do it as efficiently, and they never were very successful. And they were in competition with the same wars. So what happened is that major companies like Weems, instead of leasing a wharf or renting a wharf, they would buy the wharf so that they had exclusive rights to it so that no one else could come in and be in competition with them. That costs money, but in the long run, it also meant that you had a monopoly. So that's the way it worked. Okay, I think we've gone long enough. I appreciate it. Anyone who has that special question? <laughs> How are you?